Welcome to Leaders of Tomorrow, India's only daily television platform for small businesses. Over the past seven years, we've understood what matters most to you, the entrepreneur. And in year eight, we're taking head on two of your most pressing concerns, that of funding and mentoring. I'm Sunanda Jai Seelan, two game changers in focus tonight. First up, Rupa Kudwa for Media Network India. On the other side of a break, a special conversation with Rohini Nelkani. In a recently released report, the next half billion women who are painted as the key consumer segment now going forward are also at the higher need of being protected against the risks of the internet. In this very special conversation with Rupa Kudwa for Media Network India, she spoke to me about how small businesses should protect themselves against cyber threats and also what the company is doing when it comes to increasing its social impact in rural India. Take a listen. Rupa, thank you very much for taking the time to join us here on The Leaders of Tomorrow. And, uh, uh, you know, you've had a very interesting journey in your corporate life. And uh, uh, I want to start there by really talking to you about the fact that uh, you're one of the very few women that we see who are in the financial space, who are in the financial sector. Uh, we definitely want to see that changing. What has your own experience been like? What sort of advice would you have for uh, a woman entrepreneur, perhaps, who's watching this interview to say, this is a, I did it, this perhaps will work for you? So I was fortunate to have entered the workforce mm -hmm. at a time when the Indian economy was opening up. Sure. And I think my generation is really blessed to have benefited from the unprecedented trajectory of growth that mm. we've seen mm. as a country since then. Mm. And I'm very grateful for that. But I think if I were to point out two things that have, that have helped me in, in, in my own journey uh, is try and get ahead on the basis of your strengths because all of us have things that we don't do so well. Okay. And beyond the point, there's no point obsessing about that, but figure out what makes you different as an individual and play to those strengths okay. is number one. Number two, as a leader, I would say it's very important, and particularly in this day and age, to surround yourself with people who are better than you and yet be comfortable in your own skin. Mm. Uh, as for women entrepreneurs who are even considering whether to take the plunge, I think mm. the biggest decision is taking the plunge. Okay. And to that I would say that never before has the ecosystem for entrepreneurship in India this been as good as it is today. Okay. Uh, there's a lot more to be done, but it sure. has never been better. You have some of the best minds going into entrepreneurship. You have the best uh, uh, money, a lot of money going into, into entrepreneurship. And I think today there is a real recognition that entrepreneurship can transform India, mm. particularly using technology to bring aspirational and affordable products and services to India's mass markets. Mm. Uh, so to a woman in entrepreneur, I would say, if you're thinking of taking the plunge, India's time is now and go for it. Okay. Uh, so you spent many, many years at uh, Crystal before making that transition to Omidyar uh, Network India. And my question really is, what did you personally do to prepare for that change? Very little, actually. <laughs> okay. And what drove the change was I had spent 23 years uh, at Crystal. Yeah. I had turned 50. I could have... Uh, and I'd already been CEO for about seven to eight years. Sure. I could have stayed on for another 10 years more. And then I figured that that probably wasn't going to be good either for myself or for the company. Because while CEOs need to have long tenures, I think there's a problem if they get excessively long. Mm. And so I f figured that probably time for me to think about what next. Sure. So I went and spoke to my board and said I would like to make this transition. And they were very understanding. And from the time we made the announcement to the time that I actually left, it took almost a year. And while I was thinking about what would excite me, Omidya Network India came along and they, they reached out to me. Mm. And here was this fascinating world of, of getting into business with a purpose, working with young entrepreneurs, mm. leveraging technology. In fact, everything about this new world was something I knew nothing about. Sure. And I think therein was the charm and therein was the attraction. And I think it was really the thrill and excitement of doing something completely new and a sense of adventure and therefore jumping in with both feet. Okay. Uh, for those of our viewers who may be wondering, you know, what exactly it is that Omidya does here in India, do you want to very briefly give us, uh, uh, you know, sort of run us through what it is yes. you do? So we are an investment firm. Mm. We invest in bold entrepreneurs 
who help create a meaningful life for every Indian, mm. which means we are investing in entrepreneurs who could be in the for-profit sector, early, early stage startups, non-profit sectors, as well as entrepreneurs in government. Mm. But the lens with which we look at entrepreneurship is we, we consider those entrepreneurs who are focusing on social impact, mm. which, by which we mean focusing on providing services to the lower middle income and lower income segments of our population. Mm. So we both make equity investments in early stage startups, but we also provide grants to nonprofits who help in ecosystem development in the sectors that we work in. Okay, we speak to a lot of entrepreneurs, you know, uh, on CSR, on social impact, etc. And the view that we get most often is that social impact should be part of the DNA of every business. Why are there only few businesses that look at social impact? What's your view on that? I think this is a very important question today. Yeah. Just recently, we saw 200 top global CEOs sign uh, a declaration that they are going to make a shift in the US from focusing only on shareholder returns to balancing returns for all stakeholders. Sure. That is employees, customers, suppliers, society at large. At the end of the day, yes, all businesses do have impact. But I think we also have to recognize that businesses operate in the context of a society. Yeah. And today, the, the traditional models are coming into question because they've resulted in a lot of concentration of wealth and a lot of inequity. Mm. So something has to change about the model. Mm. And it is too early to say what a reimagined capitalist system will look like, sure. but the winds of change are certainly there. Okay. And, and I, as an impact investor, I'm delighted to see this mm. because I think that if we keep the large, if a business with a purpose, mission-driven entrepreneurs who are looking at solving the big problems of India, mm. uh, I think are the future of this country. Okay, you're speaking of the winds of change. One thing that is definitely changing uh, is the number of people who are now looking at and willing to join businesses and companies that are making a social impact, but it's perhaps not happening fast enough. Uh, what do you think that's, uh, you know, what, what do you think it's going to take really to make that change? Actually, I think they are. Okay. Uh, they may not recognize it themselves, mm -hmm. but at the end of the day, you know, we consider anyone who's making available mm. a whole r range of utilitarian and aspirational services to populations that have traditionally been underserved or excluded as being a social entrepreneur, although they may not use that tag themselves. Think about it, you know, what do we mean by utilitarian and aspirational services? We mean access to jobs, to transportation, to health care, to financial services, to education, to social communities. All these are an array of, uh, of utilitarian products and services and entrepreneurs who are creating businesses which are serving, helping lower income and excluded population get access to this, mm -hmm. I think are creating businesses with phenomenal social impact. Okay, uh, I want to reference a recently released report that you have, The Next Half Billion, where you said that women are you know, the key consumer segment when uh, compared to men. Um, but I want to talk about protecting them against really um, the harms or the dangers really of the World Wide Web, of the internet. What would you have to say on that? So that's a great question. I think one of the things we are focused on is the online journey or the mm. digital journey of mm. India's next half billion people. That is the next 500 million people who will be coming online through their mobile phones for the first time. Sure. And suddenly, mm. businesses and governments can reach this segment of the population easily, which they could not do before. Now, 50% of this population is women. How do you get them to come online and how do you come them to get them to stay online? Sure. There are two issues here. Number one, you know, in survey after survey that we've done, we've seen that the association of the smartphone today is so closely linked with entertainment mm. uh, that there are, there's a lot of social conditioning that prevents women from coming online because there's this belief that coming online will expose me to bad influences. Um, a, a patriarchal system believes that women, you don't know who they will talk to, will they have extramarital affairs, all kinds of concerns sure. like that. The second issue is women don't feel safe on the internet either. Mm. So a combination of these two have led to women staying away. What are the solutions? I think there are two main solutions here. One is creating online communities of women. And here you see a whole lot of startups who are starting to do that, whether it is startups like Pratilipi or Helofi or Shiro's 
sure. you know they are all making a difference by creating communities of women online which makes them feel safe and gets them used to the internet the second important thing that that can be done to get women online is to repurpose the positioning of the mobile phone in india and if the mobile phone can be positioned as something that can help you improve your life yeah. and not just be mm. for for entertainment mm. or social communication i think that will get more women to come on okay what next for you rupa both personally and professionally anything you want to leave us with well i'm enjoying myself tremendously i think from working with large companies and entrepreneurs who have arrived i'm now working with entrepreneurs who are beginning that journey yeah. i think it keeps me uh, it keeps me current it keeps me fresh and i'm thoroughly enjoying myself for now <laughs> wishing you all the very best such a pleasure having you here on the show thank you so much thanks We'll take a quick break on that note rohini neelkani joining us uh, on the other side of this break in the special conversation on philanthropy do stay tuned Welcome back with us here on Leaders of Tomorrow. Our second game changer tonight is Rohini Nilkani. In this very special conversation with Rohini Nilkani, who doesn't need much of an introduction, I spoke to her about why she is so focused on the intersection between Bazaar, Samaj, and Sarkar, and also what entrepreneurs should keep in mind when it comes to giving back. What they should do when it comes to encouraging those around them to also be committed to giving back. Take a listen. Rohini, thanks for taking the time to join us here on the show, and it's exciting to speak to you as part of our uh, Game Changers segment. Thank you, Sunan. Uh, you know really talking to people like yourself who are making a change and making a change at the grassroots level um and uh, you are one of the biggest philanthropists that we have in india at this point uh, and as we're kicking off this interview my question to you is what perhaps guides uh your philanthropy what is the philosophy that you are using so i've said this many times before so excuse uh, me for repeating it but my core philosophy has always been that um philanthropy should be used with responsibility obviously for society and my thing is in this continuum of samaj bazaar and sarkar my philosophy is that my philanthropy at least is directed towards strengthening institutions of the samaj mm -hmm. that while bazaar and sarkar are very important we need to strengthen institutions and individual leadership and collective leadership in the samaj so that we can have a successful society that can also hold bazaar and sarkar accountable to the larger public interest so india thrives with civil society organizations that represent or try to work on behalf of the marginalized or the poor they also try to do a lot of social innovation i try to some, support some of that in very many different areas okay so you are talking about the three pillars which is the samaj the government you're talking about society and you're talking about business or so the market place which yes. is bazaar not a lot of people bring in the third angle why is it crucial uh, as a show that is talking to entrepreneurs why do you think it's crucial that india inc is as involved uh, as perhaps say the government or society well i think for many reasons i think for example uh, business cares a lot about continuity and it has a deep interest in say rule of law right without uh, the rule of law actually businesses themselves would not have been incorporated right 300 years ago it was a kind of rule of law that brought in the limited liability company and increasingly around the world for businesses to continue they need they need some sort of public order they need rule of law to be well established sure. first for themselves but then also for society and in fact i feel that civil society organizations and businesses that is the samaj and the bazaar have a deep alignment in upholding this rule of law so it is very important for bazaar to be very involved with helping samaj institutions societal institutions create and speak on behalf of rule of law and that involves all kinds of things like people's rights justice many issues like that so even when bazaar thinks that some of those issues are not of concern directly to their bottom line and profitability actually they might be and there's now increasing research to show that okay. that to do uh, good and to do well a beginning to more and more be understood as the same thing so i believe that 
uh, bazaar of course has to be a player because uh, to create a good society you need as i said all these three things to be in balance samaj bazaar and sarkar sure. bazaar brings in innovation it brings in jobs livelihoods economic growth so but it needs to also be a partner in creating social justice and environmental justice as well sure not just through csr but inside its fence as well okay uh, i want to talk about uh, philanthropists and yes. uh, also uh, social entrepreneurs and you wear both hats uh, let's talk first about why perhaps it's so crucial in a country like india that you have entrepreneurs who are innovating for social good and do you, and do you see enough of that happening Yes, I see a lot of that happening. There are amazing people. There is uh, uh, people in the water sector and the health. I support uh, people in water, in education, in co-creating good governance, uh, in independent media, in justice, um, in several, in, in the environment a lot. And I see many. First of all, there are the old NGOs which have been working yeah. for deep and long in the grassroots, but all of lot of new young people with new modern ideas, using digital technologies to reach people, uh, using all kinds of new things. They don't have that much. Uh, sometimes uh, older NGOs might. you know because they've been there for such a long time they have a certain way of doing things the new social entrepreneurs are just thinking out of the box doing very interesting things so it's nice to meet many young energetic people who are doing that too okay but do you think a lot of the attention is being focused in uh, you know similar kind of areas for instance yes education is a huge concern in india yes. but do you think most of the funding most of the attention perhaps is going into that area would you like to see other areas receive much attention as well Yeah, it's true that a lot of uh, philanthropic capital in India has gone into education, and sometimes I feel, in spite of that, we are letting the children down because year after year, Assal tells us that the children who need to be learning are not. Yeah. Um, so uh, we have to rethink how that philanthropic capital is spent. And Nandan and I are working now on something called Ek Step, where we really hope we can make a difference fairly soon in le- looking at learning outcomes and how we can create. Uh, learning opportunities for millions of children sure. but yes other areas are crying for philanthropic capital you know the disability space is quite underfunded in india we have so many people who have disabilities and who really don't we don't have a social net in this country beyond a few subsidies and a few programs for people with disabilities people with mental health issues to fall back on right mm-hmm. and we don't have the social infrastructure to allow them to pull a leg up that's one area i mean um, i can think of mental health as i said many areas areas of health still remain underfunded uh, innovation of all kinds remains underfunded in the social sector sure. i think again justice issues um, remain underfunded so there is plenty of scope for people to spread beyond education for someone watching this interview who perhaps is leading a business no matter how small uh, who's passionate about certain causes your advice about how uh, philanthropy and giving back can be bottom up and not just top down i think Uh, to my surprise i'm learning that a lot of entrepreneurs who are becoming even a little successful mm-hmm. like when they're generating profits and feeling a little comfortable the first questions they're beginning to ask is how can i give forward mm-hmm. and so many come and ask us uh, so how should i begin what should i do i don't have much to give but i still want to start now mm-hmm. so um, uh, that is so encouraging to me because it's all right to become old and then give away your wealth but if you start giving forward when you are young mm-hmm. i think it also helps you in your business mm-hmm. because you learn so much about the social society for which you are creating economic value and um, so i'm seeing that happening so sure. i would say the minute you have some surplus enjoy giving forward okay you talk about the concept of everyday givers in india is yes. that particularly in indian sort of a phenomenon is that something that's happening largely in india so you know we just uh, together with bill and melinda gates i supported a report that was done by satwa on everyday giving sure. which is coming out soon and we find that in fact everyday giving when totaled up including that going to religious organizations and to community efforts is actually much more than our great indian wealthy are giving out okay. every year okay. now that's something to sit back and think about the ordinary people of india are giving away more than our billionaires okay. so the billionaires should listen but i also think there's lots more opportunity for people to give forward every day 
Um, there are some bottlenecks which we have talked about in the report and if we could make it easier for people to give and if we could make it easier for NGOs and uh, social entrepreneurs to showcase what they're doing better, tell their stories better, gain trust more quickly, then I think we will be astonished by how much people are willing to give uh, for people in distress, for causes, for democracy and for lots of other things that go beyond just community and religious identity. Sure. In your report, you also talk about you know the fact that uh, you perhaps would like to see uh, a billion rupees or a billion dollars being give, give, given away rather than having uh, just billionaires giving. Uh, again, is that something? I that think billionaires should give. give. I don't want Regardless, to take away yeah. the responsibility of people <laughs> sure. like us yeah. to share our wealth deeply and generously. But I think when you have broad-based funding, then people begin to participate in creating the kind of society in which they want to live, right? Yeah. When you're co-creating the society that you believe in, that's much more powerful than a few people giving a lot. Mm -hmm. A lot of people giving even a little of themselves, their money, their time, uh, is much more powerful in a democracy, in a good society than just a few people who are very wealthy, you know, basically doing what they believe to be best. This way you can have a lot of diversity of ideas play out sure. because different people will support different things and it will allow scale of a very different kind from bottom up to emerge. Sure. I think people are already doing a lot and in fact the online platforms are allowing them to give easier and in a more transparent way because the technologies yeah. allow you to uh, assemble data and show people what is actually happening. So that's going up. We are seeing it going up by 30% annually. Mm -hmm. That's really something. Yeah. And are you attributing uh, that largely to technology and how technology is changing? It's becoming easier okay. because y the young digital citizens find it very easy uh, sure. to use technological technology platforms, right, to give. So that's how we are seeing that growth happening. And that's very interesting to me. Okay. Uh, my last question to you then, uh, as a woman philanthropist, um, maybe some piece of advice that you received that uh, has changed how you think about philanthropy or giving back. I think women today in philanthropy sometimes hesitate. Sometimes because they think it's family wealth and who it's not theirs to come out and give forward. I think women would be make very good philanthropists because they have many, many energies that they tap into. I think they should not hesitate to use family wealth, obviously by building consensus, because showing the family how to be part of a society by giving forward, I think is as important a legacy you can leave as leaving them cars, jewelry, houses, sure. I don't know, whatever else people want to leave for their kids. So women should move forward boldly to do philanthropy, to leave a legacy for their families just as they would think of it in terms of material terms. Okay. That's what I believe. Such a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much. Thanks, you. Thank you. Namaste. All right. That's our show tonight. If you have any feedback for us, we're all ears. Our contact details are up on your screens in just a moment. Thanks for watching. Have a good night.